England's growing housing crisis as homelessness hits an all-time high. The number of those in temporary accommodation has soared to over 100,000 households, stuck in often grim and cramped conditions. Uh, bed bugs, uh, dump, rat infestations. Yeah, you feel like you, you are not a human being. The cost of living crisis has forced many from their homes as private landlords raise rents or even sell up. So is the government's plan to build 300,000 new homes too little? too late. Also tonight. As the Greek fires blaze on and heat records tumble worldwide, scientific proof that climate change is to blame. A serious error of judgment. The boss of NatWest admits discussing Nigel Farage's bank account with the BBC. Basking in their warm Aussie welcome, the Lionesses prepare to face Denmark on Friday. And better late than never, the 101-year-old Wren receiving her wartime medals at last, and others might be eligible too. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. There has been an alarming increase in the numbers of children and households officially classified as homeless in England, with figures at an all-time high. More than 104,000 households, including 131,000 children, are stuck in temporary accommodation, often in cramped rooms with no cooking or even washing facilities. The rise is being fuelled by landlords selling their properties or re-letting, forcing tenants to move. And charities have urged the government to ban no-fault evictions and to accelerate social house building. It comes, of course, just a day after ministers re-pledged their commitment to build 300,000 new homes a year. Our political correspondent, Carl Dinnan, heard from some of those with no place to call home. Hello, Fuad. Hello there. Hi, hi. Nice hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome, please. So this is the house. Fuad lost his home when cancer forced him out of his job as a computer engineer. With his wife and five children, he's now in a three-bed house. The family have been in temporary accommodation for six gruelling years. We have to go through so many issues along the way. Uh, bed bugs, um, dump, rat infestations, uh, being without central heating in the winter for five weeks. To, uh, to never just feel, yeah, you feel like you, you are not a human being. To get people out of temporary accommodation like this, the government says it has built more than 600,000 affordable homes since 2010. And speaking before today's figures were released, the housing secretary said they would meet their overall house building targets. In the last year, we built more homes than uh, for three decades. We're going to hit our million homes uh, uh, completed during this parliament target. And we are making sure that in the future we have a long-term plan for housing that concentrates on delivering houses where it makes the most economic and environmental sense. And that means in particular concentrating on our cities. But today's figures show that between January and March, more than 104,000 households were in temporary accommodation. That's up 10% since last year. Those households included 131,000 children, also up 10%. And the biggest single cause affecting 38% of households needing help is the loss of private rented accommodation. A government bill is supposed to make evictions more difficult. The government needs to continue its work on the Renters' Reform Bill in Parliament as soon as possible. And that's because we're seeing more people evicted into homelessness than we've ever seen from the private rented sector. And secondly, the government has got to build social homes. It's fine talking about building homes, but only social homes are going to solve this emergency. Last month, Prince William launched a campaign to end homelessness within five years. This will inspire belief throughout the UK and beyond, that homelessness can be ended for good. But it's a big problem, and he's starting at a time when it is getting worse. Carl Dinnan, ITV News. 
Well, our political correspondent Harry Horton is in Westminster for us tonight. Now, Harry, the government has been talking, hasn't it, a lot about building new homes in the last couple of days. But this is urgent, isn't it? This is a need that is happening right now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There has been lots of talk in the last few days. Michael Gove yesterday championing changes to planning laws that he hopes will allow things like shops, for example, to turn into new homes. Uh, also, as you heard in Carl's report, they're talking about the government's target to build one million new homes by the time of the next election. But as you say, look, housing shortages is nothing new. And these figures today reveal the scale of the challenge facing tens of thousands of people across the country. Now, critics say that the whole system is they say that councils are spending more money than ever before on supporting people in temporary accommodation. They point out that the government has frozen housing benefit over the last three years, whilst private rent has shot up, forcing more people, pricing more people out of their private rented homes. Now, uh, the government says it has been trying to tackle the issue. They point out that they've uh, uh, spent uh, more than two, million, two billion pounds over the last three years three years helping council support uh, people struggling with uh, homelessness. The government also says that temporary accommodation should be a last resort, but it's clear from the figures today that for thousands of people across the country, it's a permanent fixture of their day-to-day -day lives. OK, Harry Horton in Westminster. Thank you. Now, the extreme heat scorching southern Europe, North Africa and the United States would be virtually impossible without climate change caused by humans. That is the damning conclusion of a new scientific study which has made a rapid analysis of the intense heat waves this summer. It came uh, as wildfires spread to Palermo in, in Sicily, forcing the closure of its airport there. Our correspondent Emma Murphy has the latest from across the region. With one natural resource, they seek to save another. Scooping water from the sea to douse the flames engulfing the land. Fires now threaten thousands of hectares in the north of Corfu. Record high temperatures, tinder dry land and the suspected work of arsonists now leaving lives, homes and livelihoods in peril. Are we safe here? Is it close enough? I was from this side up, now the wind, look, the yeah, wind yeah. change. Yeah. So that's the danger thing. When we become uh, stronger, like, that's not good. Yeah, when comes a wind and now the wind comes to us. Yeah. So the flames are here behind, the flames are there, so. In Lafki, it was meant to be the village festival tonight. Now they just hope the village will be saved from the flames. I'm worried about the houses, I'm worried about the nature. We, ha we are a very green uh, island because of uh, the rains. Uh, and it's uh, very bad. Uh, all of us, we feel terrible. As the flames encroached, more villages were evacuated. The fire is near on the road. Because my mother in was in Anna Yes, we are, uh, there's nobody there. We took them all. Them all. Yeah. Those caught in the path were taken to safety in nearby towns. Even the animals were gathered up and moved away. Scenes like this are being replicated across the island, where police are closing roads because fires that were previously under control have been whipped up by the wind. It's the middle of the day here and it already feels like it's going dark, but that's because of the smoke and there are constant flurries of ash coming down. The heat wave across parts of Europe and North Africa has had a devastating effect. In Algeria, it's now been confirmed 34 people have died, including 10 soldiers involved in rescue efforts. Meanwhile, in Italy, Palermo Airport was forced to temporarily close when fires came too close for it to safely operate. Elsewhere in Palermo, fire crews were tackling a blaze dangerously near to one of the biggest hospitals. Patients were evacuated as the flames approached. Temperatures are expected to remain high for the next 36 hours as efforts to contain their impact continue. Emma Murphy, ITV News, Corfu. Now, of course, it is not just the impact the wildfires are having on tourism and tourists that is causing 
the real concerns. The fires are causing devastating damages to the island's wildlife and environment. It's also threatening many homes, with some locals forming their own rapid response teams as firefighters become overwhelmed. And a firefighting aircraft has crashed on the Greek island of Evia, killing both pilots. From Rhodes, our senior international correspondent John Irvine sent this report. The Greek Prime Minister says his country is at war. So far, the enemy's scorched earth policy has turned tens of thousands of acres of roads into a charred skeletal landscape. Flying over a countryside that could not be saved, this water bomber was heading to one of several fires that erupted on the island today. It's boiling hot and bone dry, and where there's no intervention, the blazes here are rampant. <laughs> Having cleared many of the East Coast beach resorts of tourists, the fires are now posing a greater threat inland, where several small villages are in danger of being enveloped by flames. Local people have formed their own rapid response teams. They're trying to stop the fires from reaching their homes. One of the remarkable things about this Greek emergency is just how many days it's been going on for, thanks to the most prolonged heat wave in living memory. Another thing that sets this year's wildfire season apart is just how much of this country is under threat. Today, fires are burning on Corfu in the northwest and here on roads in the southeast. Virtually all of Greece lies in between and much of it is at risk. The emergency services are flat out and exhausted. Water bombing aircraft have been flying non-stop and making the lowest possible drops even when smoke hampers visibility. Tragically, the crisis has claimed its first fatalities. The two Greek crew members were killed when their plane crashed after clipping a tree. This has been a test of endurance, but there is a glimmer of hope with temperatures forecast to go down from Thursday onwards. The dip can't come soon enough. John Irvine, ITV News, Rhodes. Well, more holidaymakers have been arriving back in the UK after being evacuated from Rhodes. Neil Connery is at Birmingham Airport, where some of the flights have arrived. And Neil, what have the tourists been saying to you? Yes, Mary, more of those uh, scheduled flights from Rhodes arriving back in the UK today with tourists on board, one of them touching down here uh, at Birmingham. Uh, some of those caught up in uh, those dramatic scenes that we witnessed at the weekend, reliving the experiences they went through. One holidaymaker we spoke to uh, spoke of his gratitude at those who'd helped him. Well, I have never met people like him and want to thank him so much because every, everyone was volunteers and um, it was brilliant. There were scouts, there was little old ladies, there was farmers coming in with fruit and things like this. So a very painful and difficult few days for those caught up in all of this. But I think it's important to stress that the vast majority of people on this one flight that landed here at Birmingham told me that they had not been affected, their holidays had not been affected by what had happened with these wildfires. They said they'd enjoyed themselves and they'd go back to Rhodes. And I think what that brings into focus here is this very difficult decision that the Greek authorities and the British government have to give when it comes to travel advice. The key tonight, as it has been for the last few days, is check with your travel operator if you're due to head to Rhodes in the coming days or weeks. It is a finely balanced decision for those weighing this all up. The safety of those who live on Rhodes, a population of around 100,000, some two and a half million holidaymakers who visit the island every year. Uh, currently, at the moment, there's 10,000 British tourists on that island. The safety of everyone on roads is clearly the key. I think it is a day-by-day -day, uh, assessment that is going on depending on what is happening on the ground right now that will determine the effect of this going forward. Okay. Neil Connery at Birmingham Airport, thank you. And uh, Alex is here now with a closer look at what the scientists are saying about how climate change is causing all this. Um, and Alex, it's about proof, isn't it? 
Uh, that's right. So uh, what the top climate scientists are doing, they've collated all of the data relating to extreme weather we've been seeing and are using their supercomputer to crunch the numbers and they've simulated the effects of emissions being pumped into the atmosphere. So compared to a world without human-induced climate change, heat waves in Europe are now two and a half degrees Celsius hotter. The report goes on to say extreme heat events in southern Europe would have been virtually impossible without the burning of fossil fuels. Going forward, they say we can expect heat waves like the ones we are seeing to become even more common, occurring every two to five years. As well as wildfires, Europe has seen other extreme weather events this week. Heavy rainfall, storms and droughts happening more often and with more force as a result of rising global temperatures. This is Switzerland this week following a storm in the west of the country. The Swiss Weather Service said a probable tornado caused significant damage to buildings and resulted in a falling crane killing one person. Across in Germany, some cities have declared a state of emergency this week after seeing severe storms and flooding. And in parts of northern Italy, torrential rain and hailstorms flooded streets across the region, injuring more than 100 people. Last summer was Europe's hottest since records began. And figures show deaths as a result of that heat surpassed 61,000. The authors of the report are calling for action from world leaders to rapidly stop burning fossil fuels to prevent future heat waves from growing hotter, longer and even more deadly. OK, interesting stuff. Alex, thank you very much indeed. And uh, if you are planning to holiday in Europe over the summer and are worried about what's ahead, you can find the latest situation and advice on your rights on our website. Well, in other news now, a man and a five-year-old boy have been found dead at a house in Leicester. The pair were discovered unconscious around nine o'clock last night and were later pronounced dead at the scene. Leicestershire Police has started an investigation but currently is not looking for anyone else in connection with the deaths. A man has been convicted of the sexual assault and murder of his 16-year-old sister. Connor Gibson, who's 20, was found guilty of attacking his sister Amber in November 2021 in Hamilton, South Lanarkshire. He will be sentenced in September. Now, MPs have written to The Sun newspaper and also to the BBC about allegations over the presenter Hugh Edwards. The Culture, Media and Sport Committee wants to know what steps the paper took to verify the story. And it wants the BBC to detail what reviews it has made into the claims. Well, our correspondent Rebecca Barry is here with more on this. And so, Rebecca, first of all, take us through exactly what these letters said. Well, firstly, a quick reminder on how we got here. It was earlier this month that The Sun published allegations that a BBC presenter had paid for sexually explicit images from a teenager. At first, The Sun didn't name Hugh Edwards, but for days there were rumours. Then the police confirmed that there was no information to indicate that a criminal offence had been committed. It was then that Hugh Edwards' family revealed that he was in hospital being treated for serious mental health issues. Uh, now, the culture Media and Sport Committee has written to The Sun asking for information about its decision to publish those very serious allegations. And the letter reads, Our role is not to challenge individual stories or editorial decisions, but we would be grateful if you could set out the processes by which The Sun verifies any story it chooses to report, especially those where issues of privacy may be at stake. Well, today, The Sun's editor, Victoria Newton, responded, insisting that in-depth considerations went into both privacy and public interest before publishing that story. She also points out that other coverage frequently omitted the fact that the teenager involved was apparently vulnerable and a drug addict. Now, separately, the group of MPs, the committee of MPs, has written to the BBC calling for transparency as it now reviews how public complaints are red flagged because it says that trust from the public is vital if they're to retain confidence in the BBC. Mm. And the committee has also asked the son about its uh, former employee, of course now GB News presenter, Dan Wooten. Yeah, that's right. Uh, last week, Dan Wooten, the former Sun journalist, now a presenter on GB News, responded to allegations against him. Claims that he'd used a fake 
identity to pay for sex videos, so-called catfishing. Dan Witten described it as a witch hunt, saying although he'd made errors of judgment in the past, uh, any criminal allegations against him were simply untrue. Today, the editor of The Sun told MPs that it takes these allegations very seriously. It's appointed an outside law firm, but it won't comment any further while it's investigating. OK, Rebecca Barry, thank you. OK, well, there is uh, plenty more still to come the ITV Evening News, including a story breaking in the last hour or so. What the boss of Nat West has said after admitting to being the source behind a BBC story about Nigel Farage. Families searching for answers. Mystery still surrounds exactly what happened at this bar in South Africa where 21 teenagers died. Kids started falling. And he's, the bouncer saw the kids were falling, like we were screaming that we were falling, asking him to please open the door. And a cancer breakthrough, a new drug that can target formerly untreatable forms of the disease. We'll bring you the latest updates from our business editor uh, as the NatWest fallout unfolds and the rest of the news after the break. See you then. And welcome back. Now, a tumour-shrinking drug is offering new hope to cancer patients who don't respond to existing treatments. A medical trial on patients with ovarian cancer has reported some success. And the drug could pave the way, apparently, for a completely new type of immunotherapy. Here's a chill carrier on what's promising to be some pretty good results. It is a treatment which uses our own body's defences to fight cancer by helping our immune systems recognise, target and destroy these orange corrupted cells. But immunotherapy has only been effective for certain types of cancers. Now a new class of drugs being trialled could offer hope to many thousands. I got told it's stage four bowel cancer. It just pretty much shattered day-to-day -day life as it existed. It was shock after shock after shock. Mo Huck was diagnosed with bowel cancer eight years ago. Without immunotherapy, he says he wouldn't be here today. One year after my diagnosis, I was told there's nothing else they can do for me. The chemo wasn't working, the cancer was growing. And in effect, I was a terminal cancer patient. I had the treatment and just as the clinical s studies were showing, it worked really well. Um, the, the tumours have gone, um, I'm, I'm fit and healthy. The treatment worked for Mo because bowel cancer responds to the drugs used in current immunotherapy. But ovarian and certain types of skin and breast cancers are resistant. The work being carried out by researchers at this laboratory at Guy's Hospital in London aims to change that with a new type of immunotherapy drug which has shown promising results in initial clinical trials. Ovarian cancer, which was a case study for this trial, has very few therapies available to it. So we hope that this antibody can wake up the patient's immune system in a way no other drug is, has been able to do and works in the environment where the cancer resides. It does it by binding the antibodies to tumour cells providing a marker for the immune system to find and then kill the cancer. Could this be a cure? I would say that it's possible that this drug could offer a cure for certain types of patient groups, and this is what we are very excited to test in the next few years. The plan now is to expand the trial to bigger groups of patients and different types of cancers, with a view to save as many lives as possible. Sejal Karia, ITV News. Now, eight men have been convicted over the 2016 Brussels terror attacks that left 32 people dead. The trial lasted more than seven months. In a special court, there were 10 defendants accused of aiding suicide bombers at the Brussels airport and a busy subway station. Eight were convicted of murder and attempted murder. Now here, the NatWest boss, Dame Alison Rose, is under huge pressure tonight after she admitted a serious error of judgment over the row between Nigel Farage and the NatWest-owned Coots Bank. 
The managing director said she had been wrong to respond to questions from the BBC about Nigel Farage's private bank account being closed. Our well, business editor Joel Hills is here. All right, this has been rumbling on for a while, hasn't it? It's now gone to the very top of the bank. Can she survive? Dame Alison Rose, of course. Let's take a step back, because I suspect some of our okay, viewers might on. be feeling a little bit confused <laughs> by all this. Three weeks ago, the BBC reported that Nigel Farage's bank account at Coots, a private bank for the very wealthy, had been closed. Now, the BBC report cited that a source had told them it was a commercial decision. Nigel Farage insisted there was more to it than that, that his account had been closed for political reasons. He then obtained an internal document from Coots which showed very clearly that his political views were a consideration. Now, yesterday, the BBC apologised publicly and fully to Mr Farage. It accepted the original story was inaccurate. The business editor, Simon Jack, though, insisted that the story came from a trusted and senior source this afternoon, the chief executive of NatWest Group. Alison Rose outed herself as that source in a statement. She says, I recognise that in my conversations with Simon Jack of the BBC, I made a serious error of judgment in discussing Mr Farage's relationship with the bank. But, she adds, I would like to emphasise that in responding to Mr Jack's questions, I did not reveal any personal financial information about Mr Farage. However, she does recognise that I left Mr Jack with the impression that the decision to close Mr Farage's accounts was solely a commercial one, which we now know it wasn't. Alison Rose then confirming she wasn't in her statement part of the team that made the decision. She wasn't in the room. Her understanding as of April was that it was a commercial decision. Tonight, the chairman of the bank, Howard Davis, Sir Howard Davis, said, after careful re reflection to your question, Mary, she's staying. It retains, the board retains full confidence in Alison Rose as chief executive. It wants her continue, to continue, but suggests that her pay this year will reflect what has just happened. Interesting to see what the bank's biggest shareholder does. The taxpayer. We still have a 38% stake in the bank. Notionally, the bank is entirely operationally independent. This is not the end of it. Ministers are going to be asked what should be happening next, whether Alison Rose is considered to be fit and proper to continue. Nigel Farage, all he said is the statements between NatWest and the BBC are contradictory. This isn't over. OK. Joel, thank you. Now, radiographers in England have become the latest NHS workers to take strike action over pay. The 48-hour walkout started this morning after they rejected a 5% offer from the government. Pablo Taylor is outside Nottingham's City Hospital. Uh, so, Pablo, how is this strike going to be affecting services? Well, Mary, today's walkout was quite unique, really, because it involved radiographers. These are staff that perform really important scans on patients, things like x-rays on people who have broken bones, but also really important checks for diseases like cancer. Now, they haven't walked out in some 40 years, but today around 4,000 of them from 37 hospital trusts across England walked out, prompting the cancellation of hundreds of thousands of routine scans. Now, today we've been hearing about why they took that decision to go on strike. I'm striking today. Um, it's been a really tough decision to make, um, uh, but it's primarily because of pay. Um, we want our pay restored um, we, in line with the junior doctors and the teachers. We've got these huge backlogs, both in cancer and other diagnostic areas as well, um, and we just can't get through them. There's not enough staff. Uh, we've got staff leaving all the time and we've not got any new staff coming in. So it's hitting a point where we're not going to have enough staff to treat patients, and that would be really sad. Well, as you heard from one of those radiographers there, they're also angry at the fact that junior doctors uh, have just been offered a 6% pay rise, but the government is sticking to its offer of 5% for them. Now, they say at a time of rising costs, every penny counts. Now, today, the Health Secretary, Stephen Barclay, said that offer of 5% was not only fair, but final. He's uh, urged radiographers to call off their strike days, the second of which is planned for tomorrow. Okay. Pablo Taylor uh, in Nottingham, thank you. You're watching the ITV Evening News. It's just a little bit after seven o'clock now. Here's what's still ahead. Are you always struggling to find a seat and forced to stand? Find out whether your commute is one of the country's most overcrowded. Daring to dream. 
down under. The Lionesses gear up to take on Denmark at the Women's World Cup. Definitely a pinch me moment. They know how much it means to me to, to step out and play for England, but especially at a tournament like this. The 101-year-old Wren finally honoured for her wartime service. And we've already seen above average rainfall this month, but the month isn't over yet, and neither is the rain, I'm afraid. I'll have all the details coming up in the national forecast later in the programme. Well, that's all coming up, but uh, before that, the agonising fight for justice for the families of 21 teenagers who died at an overcrowded bar in South Africa a year ago. The victims of the disaster were aged between 13 and 17 years old. It happened in the city of East London, but despite the demands for justice, nobody has been charged in connection with the deaths. Now, at first, parents were privately told that their children had died from asphyxiation. But then came competing claims, first a gas leak, a stampede, or even poisoning from counterfeit alcohol. Now, officially, none of the theories has been ruled out, and the forensic and coroner's reports remain sealed. Our correspondent Rohit Katru travelled to East London to investigate, and here is his special report. For some of the youngsters at this party last year, they were celebrating not just the end of their exams, but the start of something else, something bigger. Freedom, life, the beginning of what they felt would be their best years. We were excited to see so many people because people came from places, far places, cool kids, pretty kids, and we looked pretty, we looked our best that day. This would be an unforgettable night indeed. Zingi watched as children began collapsing all around her. We tried to ask the bouncer to please let us out because we were suffocating inside. We couldn't breathe. Kids started falling. And he, the bouncer saw the kids were falling, like we were screaming that we were falling, asking him to please open the door, asking him to please call our parents. You just watched your friend die next to you. At first, parents of the victims were told their children had died from asphyxiation. But then came competing claims of a gas leak, of a stampede, of poisoning from counterfeit alcohol. 21 children were killed, the eldest aged 17, the youngest 13. And yet, somehow, no one can say... 13 months on, since Nelly lost her daughter, oh killed that night at the Enyobeni Tavern. She's my child, she's my friend, she, she's everything about me, but now I'm lonely. It's because of Enyobeni. It's not easy for me. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's painful. Only one charge has been brought against the owners of the tavern and specifically for the sale of alcohol to children. This way? The place has been closed down, so when we went there, we were surprised to see the owners there too. In court, if you see the parents and everybody in court looks at me as a matter, they are saying it publicly. They are talking to everybody. They are saying it loud so I can hear. And are they right or are they wrong? They're wrong. They're wrong. I did not kill anybody. And I am not responsible for the death of anyone. They defended their actions that night and said the children must have been drinking somewhere else. So they just turned up and what, just sat on the sofas or they what? They forced themselves in. But these are kids, right? I mean, these were, were small kids. kids. They were small kids. And, and they forced their way past your bounces. bouncers. Yeah. Bouncers, plural. Yeah. More than one bouncer. Yeah. You know, big big guys. Yes. And these these small kids forced their way yeah. past them. There was a lot of them. And others were climbing. So I'm not sure what transpired, what what actually happened at the decade. How can it be that still no one seems sure about what happened? A lack of urgency is a well known characteristic of South Africa's legal system. But in this unequal society, 
even justice comes with haves and have-nots. What the families wonder is whether their experience has been made worse because of where they live, because of who they are. The simplest explanation for the lack of an explanation is the most painful too. That even after a tragedy like this, the people of the townships are no one's priority. Rohit Katru, ITV News in the Eastern Cape. And you can see Rohit's full report from South Africa on tonight's On Assignment. And that's right after news at 10. Well, let's move on and get an update on what's making the news tonight. The boss of NatWest has admitted a serious error of judgment in talking about Nigel Farage's relationship with its private banking arm Coots with a reporter. Dame Alison Rose said she had been wrong to respond to questions from the BBC about Mr Farage's account being closed. The number of people living in temporary accommodation in England is at its highest since records began in 1998. And scientists say that the heat wave gripping southern Europe would have been virtually impossible without human-induced climate change. It comes as blazes continue across a number of Greek islands. Now here, overcrowding on train services across England and Wales has worsened. Latest figures show it comes as the number of commuters has soared since the end of the pandemic. And that means for growing numbers of passengers, it is standing room only, as our North of England reporter Kelly Foran explains. Standing on a platform to stand on a train. This was the journey into Farringdon at 8 o'clock this morning. And more than 200 miles north, it was a similar sight. Joey used to take this journey from Preston to Manchester every day for work. But doing this day in, day out became unbearable. People often argue, people bickered. It just wasn't a particularly comfortable atmosphere in that sense. And it wasn't, a, like I said, pleasant to be around. Things got so bad for you that you stopped getting the train altogether? Yeah, so in the end, it formulated part of my decision. Why to stop commuting to Manchester um, five days a week. Between that and the cost and the commute and the sort of conditions you were in, it just wasn't worth my time. And it, I decided to pursue my career elsewhere. Almost 80,000 people arrive here into Manchester every single day. It's one of the busiest stations in the country. One in seven of them are spending their journeys in peak times on their feet. I commute probably three, four days per week and I'd say at least half those days around any seats. After my stop it gets busy, so yes, there are people standing up in my train as well. And when I have to go out of the city, I'm always getting seats because I booked the train ahead of time. So you've never had to stand on a never. train? Never, honestly. I mean, it's not ideal, but I think it's just something that we're used to, to be honest. Um, it would be nice to have a seat, but there's not much we can do about it, really. Pre-pandemic, this was a much more familiar scene. Less of us are now using trains, but whether or not you can get a seat is a chance passengers just have to take. Kelly Foran, ITV News. Now, the telecoms company Virgin Media O2 is to cut up to 2,000 jobs by the end of this year. The redundancies will affect around 12% of its workforce, but the firm says it is supporting its staff as it has open and honest conversations about its future. The makers of Marmite and Magnum, Unilever, says its profits have risen by a fifth over six months, based almost entirely on rising prices. The company made pre-tax profits of £3.3 billion, despite selling fewer goods. Unilever's boss denies passing on higher costs to consumers. And Spotify has increased prices for its premium plans in the UK. Subscriptions are set to rise by £1 a month to keep up with inflation. It follows a series of price hikes from other music subscription services such as Apple, Amazon and Tidal. Now, Wembley Stadium is to strengthen its security in response to the violent scenes at the Euro 2020 final between England and Italy. Measures include a huge fence around the perimeter and Ellie Pitt is there tonight. R remind us, Ellie, what happened? 
Well, cast your mind back, Mary, to July 2021. It was the England-Italy Euro 2020 final. Uh, the kickoff was not until the evening, but by midday, 10,000 fans had already started gathering around Wembley Stadium ahead of the match. An independent report found that, fueled by alcohol and drugs, many of them took part in what Baroness Casey, the author of that report, described as disgraceful behaviour. 2,000 ticketless fans actually made their way inside Wembley Stadium and only around 400 of them were kicked back out. They overwhelmed the stewards and they broke in through the entrances for disabled visitors. Now today, planning permission has been given to Wembley Stadium to step up security measures, including a 3.6 metre high fence and roller shutters around part of the stadium, which it's hoped will deter any fans without a ticket from trying to break in in the future. That work is expected to start in the autumn. OK, Ellie Pitt at Wembley, thank you. Well, to the Women's World Cup now, the Philippines made history by winning against co-hosts New Zealand. New Zealand, danger still not clear though. Cross comes in, looking for Bolden! Serena Bolden headed in what turned out to be an historic winner for the Filipinas as New Zealand failed to build on their opening win against Norway. And the England midfielder Ella Toon has told ITV Sport the team has learnt lessons after the underwhelming performance against Haiti. The Lionesses won their opening match 1-0 thanks to a penalty and they know that they'll have to do better against their next opponent, Denmark, on Friday morning. Our sports editor Steve Scott reports. At their new training base, the Lionesses were treated to one of the world's oldest ceremonies. An ancient welcome protecting guests physically and spiritually, practiced for centuries by the Darkingjung community. Also there, two and a half thousand fans watching Serena Wiegmann put her squad through their paces. England have one less than convincing win under their belt, so there is plenty of work to do beneath Australia's winter sun. I think there was a few lessons learned. We obviously knew that they were going to be a tough team, that you can't underestimate any team in this in this tournament. Um, it's the World Cup and everyone has bags of talent. I think we learned that the main thing is that we got the win. We started the tournament off with a win, which is massive and can only help us going forward. Georgia Stanway's retaken penalty was just enough to squeeze past unfancied Haiti in England's opener. It is World Cup! The Lionesses have Mary Earps to thank for their winning start. Oh, what a save by Mary Earps. If her form continues, Nike will surely regret not selling replica shirts of England's star stopper. It's ended up in the net. Next up, it's Denmark, who needed a late winner themselves to get their World Cup off on the right foot against China. Hey, you were a fantastic side. Denmark are going to bring something completely different. So, yeah, we're looking at them. We know what they're going to... We know what they're going to bring and we're working hard in training. For now, the centre of attention, another three points this week, will help build some much-needed momentum and at the same time settle a few nerves at home. Steve Scott, ITV News. Well, still to come before Emmerdale, 80 years on but not forgotten, recognising a 101-year-old Wren's wartime service. And it's already been the wettest July in years, but I'm afraid we'll need to hang on to those brollies a little longer. I'll have the national forecast coming up next. And do join me and Alex for that after this short break. Alec, and welcome back. Time for the weather now, and Alex is back. And it's already been the wettest July in years, and I am bored yes. of wet, I'm afraid. Aren't we all? Honestly, yeah. we really could do with a bit of summer making a comeback, but that's not going to be happening anytime soon. Let's take a quick look at the rainfall stats so far for July, and we've still got a few more days to go. But as you can see, all four nations have seen above average rainfall. Take a look at Northern Ireland, 168%. 
of the average, which is very wet indeed. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some records broken, but we won't know that for a few days yet. Let's take a quick look though at the jet stream and see where that is at the moment. And as we know, that is the dividing line between the heat that is across southern parts of Europe and the cooler conditions which we are on the other side of. So I'm afraid whilst it stays in this kind of position, we're still going to see those Atlantic lows making their way towards us. So prepare for more rain, particularly tomorrow into Thursday. Let's take a look right now. The warm weather continues. So why not squeeze the most out of the day? Heinz Tomato Ketchup. Sponsors ITV National Weather. Well, let's start by taking a quick look at the pressure pattern. And I want to show this system out in the Atlantic at the moment, which is making its way towards us. And that's what's going to bring in some fairly persistent rain as we get towards the latter part of tomorrow into Thursday. Ahead of it though, there will be some bright spells of sunshine, so make the most of them where you can. Let's take a look at the situation then for this evening and overnight. And we're actually going to see a little bit of rain affecting some northern parts of England as we head through the small hours of Wednesday. So a relatively small front here, but to the north and to the south, it is going to be rather dry with some lengthy clear breaks. And in those clear breaks, particularly in countryside areas, the temperature is going to slip down into single figures. So a cool night uh, for sleeping for sure. And as we start tomorrow, well, as I say, it is going to be a bright start across many places. Although you can see across the northern part of England down the North Sea coast, always a little bit cloudy with that rain clearing away. As it clears away, we see more showers arriving and then this more substantial band of rain starts to edge in towards the end of tomorrow afternoon. In these kinds of conditions, temperatures will be a little down, but they're still going to make, make say 20 up across the north, but more like 24 down across the southeast. But that will start to drop as that rain begins to push through. Fast forward to Thursday and much of that rain is out of the way, but we are going to be left with the legacy of cloud cover across much of the British Isles, as you can see. Having said that, temperatures are still around average for the time of year. Looking further ahead into the weekend, I'm afraid it's a very showery situation, some of which will be quite heavy. Heinz Tomato Ketchup sponsors ITV National Weather. So there you have it. Looks like we'll be holding on to our brollies that a bit longer. Sorry, Mary. Mm, I do not want to take my brolly out. <laughs> it is July, for goodness sake. OK, Alex, thank you. And uh, finally tonight, the former Wren, who has been recognised for her wartime service almost 80 years on. Iris Burrow served with the Women's Royal Naval Service as a telephone operator during the Second World War. Now, at the age of 101, she has received two medals and a lapel badge after her children realised she'd missed out for all these years. John Ray went to meet them. In a long life well lived, Iris Burrow has learned that patience is a virtue. Oh, there's my medals. Great. Yes, and it's a long time, isn't it? 78 years, to be exact. Well, it has been a long, long time waiting. But it has been very good. Yes, I'm very proud. Chief Petty Officer Burrow was a teenager when she joined the Women's Royal Naval Service. And 101 years old, when she finally received recognition for her service and the sacrifice. She remembers the comrades killed when her base was bombed. Yes, it was loud. Very, very loud then. Was it, was it, was it frightening? Yes, it was frightening, but I had to get on with it. And just as vivid is the memory of the dashing officer who gave her a lift, the actor Lawrence Olivia, then a lieutenant pilot. I know he was extremely nice to me, you know, because he, he knew that he'd got me in the car to go up to the camp. <laughs> was he handsome? Yes, he was. Like many women, Iris left the service before the war's end and missed out on any medals. I will be thinking of you. On... This letter from Queen Camilla has helped set the historical record straight. People like you really are backbone of our country. Well, if you think about, you know, how people view veterans, uh, she's part of the club now. She's officially part of the club. There may be others like Iris still to be honoured. Her message? That it's not too late. John Ray, ITV News.
That's a great story. That's all from us for now. Julie's here with News at 10, but from me and all the evening news team, 